So now we have all the tools we need to start analyzing what the government could do to fix or correct recessionary or inflationary gaps. What do we do when the amount of spending that we have is less than the full employment level of GDP or more than the full employment level of GDP? This chapter will just cover fiscal policy. This is fiscal with an F, fiscal policy. That is uh, changes in government spending and taxes in order to affect the economy. Um, in chapters 14, 15, and 16, there'll be other things the government could do with monetary policy. So that's next unit. For this chapter, we're going to look at what we could change with government spending and taxes to correct those recessionary or inflationary expenditure gaps. So we're going to use that model that we developed last chapter, that aggregate demand, aggregate supply model, and use that to estimate the changes in spending necessary or the change in tax necessary to correct those gaps. We'll also look at uh, the public debt. So fiscal policy, remember with an F, not physical, fiscal policy is deliberate changes in government spending. So if we have a recession, we can increase government spending to push that aggregate demand curve to the right, or we can decrease taxes. If we decrease taxes, business taxes or consumer taxes, uh, household taxes, either way, we can give businesses or households more money to spend, and that would shift the aggregate demand curve to the right trying to get to that full employment level. That's our goal. On the flip side, we might not be having problems with recession. We could be having problems with inflation. If that were the case, we'd need to decrease that aggregate demand curve. So that means we need to shift aggregate demand to the left. So we could decrease government spending or we could increase taxes. If we increase taxes, people or businesses won't have as much money to spend, and that shifts aggregate demand to the left, always trying to get aggregate demand to move towards that full employment level. If we're in the midst of a recession, the appropriate policy is expansionary fiscal policy. Expansionary fiscal policy is going to be an increase in government spending a decrease in tax, or a combination of both. Why do we say a combination? Well, if you were a United States uh, congressional representative or a senator, what would your number one goal be? Well, it has to be to be reelected, right? Because you can't do the good you want to do in office if you're not in office. So you've got to please both sides of your constituents. Some of your constituents will want an increase in government spending new roads or bridges or schools or hospitals, whatever government money might be used in your area. If you have a, a military base, that sort of thing. We want more government spending to benefit our area. But some of the constituents will not want an increase in government spending. They'll say government is already too big. We need government to decrease our taxes so that we can spend our own money instead of government spending it. So to please both sides, you would probably institute some sort of um, policy where you would be both increasing government spending and decreasing taxes. So let's just spend a minute and really look at this. So remember you have uh, the price level on the vertical axis. You have GDP down here on the horizontal axis. So let's go ahead and draw our aggregate supply curve. Remember it had a horizontal region, an upward sloping region, and then it had a vertical region. So here's our aggregate supply curve. And then let's go ahead and say that full employment is right here. Full employment will always be somewhere in the upward sloping region. And let's put an aggregate demand curve that goes through that spot. So then this is aggregate demand that's associated with full employment. So we're gonna put an F here so we know that that's full employment. Make my dot bigger so it looks right. And so this level of GDP down here 
is the GDP associated with full employment. So we'll go ahead and make that note. That's an F, GDP, full employment. I know I didn't do that very well. All right, and then this is the price level that's associated with full employment. Okay, so there's where we wanna be. But if we're currently struggling with the recession, where's our current um, aggregate demand curve? Well, it'd be somewhere to the left, right? Let's say it's right here. So this is our current curve, and I'm gonna to try to label it aggregate demand current. So if this looks really awful, hopefully you will know that it's supposed to say, this is where we are right now. This is where we currently are. But we really want to be at this full employment level, so we're trying to increase aggregate demand. So this is where we currently are. So let's just label this as a hundred. I'm just trying to make a point here. And let's label this as 150. Whoops, I lost my 100, didn't I? 150. So right now, we have this expenditure gap of 50 billion, meaning we want to push this aggregate demand curve to the right where it'll intersect at this higher level of GDP that is our full employment level. So then we could calculate the change in government spending needed change in government spending needed in order to shift that aggregate demand curve to the right. Well, you just have to go with that's government spending. And that's going to be the change in GDP needed divided by the multiplier. So we have to have some information so that we can calculate this. So let's just make an assumption that our MPC is 0.9. Well, and I'm gonna put it over here. If our MPC, oops, if our MPC is 0.9, what's our MPS? If you subtract 90 cents from a dollar, what do you have left over? You have 10 cents. So then your MPS is 0 0.10, 0 0.1. The zero really has no meaning, so we can drop it. So then how do you calculate multiplier? So our multiplier formula, do you remember it? Our multiplier formula is one over MPS, right. And so our multiplier formula is one over 0.1, which is gonna give us 10. So let's go back over here and calculate the change in government spending. We want to be at 150, we're currently at 100, so we need a change in governments in a GDP of 50, and we have a multiplier of 10. So 50 divided by 10 means the change in government spending we need is five. Keep in mind what's dollar values and what's not. That five is a dollar value and this 50 is a dollar value. So the change in government spending would be five. If we were going to do a decrease in tax, then we'd take that change in government spending, so let's do that, so change in tax equals the change in government spending. Remember the delta triangle signs mean change in case you've forgotten. So the change in spending, that's that change in government spending that we just calculated to be five. And we're gonna need to divide that by the MPC, by the amount of the change that people would, act, the change in tax that people would actually spend. So the change in spending we need is five. And the change in, um, Oh, no, I'm sorry, the MPC here is 0.9. I can't seem to get the point where you could see it. So then we do what is 5 divided by 0.9. And know that our change in tax is 5.5 repeating. We can just round this to 5.6. It's going to be repeating. All right, I want you to notice that the change in tax 
is bigger than the change in government spending. The change in government spending was 5. The change in tax is 5.6. Why would that be? Well, the change in tax has to account for how much of that tax change would people save versus what they would spend. So that, re that um, we have to change taxes by 5.6 billion to get them to spend five, because we need a spending change of five. Uh, the remainder of that 0.6 billion is going to be the change in savings. So if we were gonna do a combination, then you would calculate how much of the change you wanted to come from government spending. We need five, so we could say, I don't know, let's get four from a change in government spending. Well, if you're gonna get four from a change in government spending, you need five, so you're gonna to have to take that extra one billion that we need and divide that by the MPC and see that you'll have to change tax by 1.1 repeating or 1.2 million if you're round. Well, no, that's going to round down. So just 1.1 million. If you were, I'll just do another example real quick. If you want to choose that you're going to get $4 million from an increase in government spending, I just did four, didn't I? Because that left us one. If you're going to get $3 billion from a change in government spending, then you would do your five minus three leaves two left over to be gotten from a change in tax, and two divided by the MPC, here 0.9, is 2.2 billion. So figure out what your change in government spending is gonna be first, subtract that from the total change that you need, use the leftover to get your change in tax, but you have to divide that leftover amount by the NPC. This is just the graphic that shows exactly what we just did. So that $5 billion change in spending shifted the aggregate demand curve all the way to the right by the total amount of spending that we needed. Here they had 510 as their full employment GDP, but we were at the 490. So here we needed a $20 billion change in GDP. They're using an MPC of 0.75, so an MPS of 0.25. Multipliers one divided by 0.25, so four. So when they increased government spending by five, five times four gave them the full increase in aggregate demand of the 20 billion that they needed. Sometimes it's not um, recession that we're worried about. Sometimes it's inflation. It's going to work the same way. All the calculations are the same. There's the price level. Let's put GDP down here. So let's draw our aggregate supply curve, horizontal, upward sloping, vertical. These are three regions of our aggregate supply curve. Let's say this is full employment. So we want an aggregate demand curve that goes through that full employment spot. So here's our aggregate demand for the full employment. This is where we wanna be. We always wanna be at full employment. So if we come down here, that's our GDP full employment. So we'll label that with an F. Where would we currently be if we're having problems with inflation? Well, we would currently be somewhere way up here on our aggregate supply curve. So we can label that as our current curve. Where do we want to be? We want to be at that full employment level. So we're going to have to do something that would shift. I shouldn't say we're going to have to. The government might choose to enact a fiscal policy that would shift this aggregate demand curve leftward, trying to get to that full employment level. So here's where we would currently be at this really high price. So this would be our price level one where we currently are. Here's the full employment price level where we wanna be. That's where we wanna be. So let's pull this number down here. Play with this. 
So this is our current level. Let's say we're currently, let's see, they said 510 was the full employment level. So let's just choose a number less than 510. We'll just play. So let's see, 5, yeah, let's make this one 540. Just kind of figuring out what would give us some nice round numbers. 540, and then let's make this one 510. Okay. Now, I want you to correct this gap. Let's use some MPC we haven't been using. So let's try an MPC, I don't know, just for the fun of it. This is not uh, really very real world. But let's say we have an MPC of 0.5, okay? That means for every dollar we get, we're going to spend 50 cents and we'll save 50 cents. I don't know anybody who saves that much, but let's say we do. So if we have an MPS of 0.5, then how do we calculate multiplier? So our multiplier is going to be 1 divided by the MPS, 1 divided by 0.5, that's going to give us a multiplier of 2. So calculate that change in government spending. Do you remember how to do that from a couple of slides back? We're going to divide the change in GDP that we need by the multiplier. So how much GDP do we need? We need to increase 30, right? So that would be that 30 divided by our multiplier of 2. So how much change in spending do we need? So we'd need 15 billion here, change in spending. That's a dollar figure, this is a dollar figure. Always trying to keep up with where we're talking about dollars. So then if we were going to correct this contractionary expenditures gap, meaning we need to pull that aggregate demand curve back to the left, then we would need to decrease government spending by 15 billion. We could also get it by changing tax so what are you going to do to calculate your tax change? Remember? Well, that's that change in government spending that we need. Ah, they quit writing. There we go. Change in government spending we need divided by the MPC, and the MPC was 0.5. So then we need to calculate what 15 billion divided by 0.5 is. Duh, that would get us back to the 30, wouldn't it? There we go. So we can decrease government spending by 15, or we can increase taxes by 30, or we can do some combination of both. So a combination would look something like decrease government spending by 10, and increase taxes by the 15 minus 10, 5, divided by the MPC of 0.5. Whenever we do use expansionary fiscal policy, I didn't say it while ago, but that's always going to cause a budget deficit because we're spending more money than we have. If we use contractionary fiscal policy, we're going to create a budget surplus because we're not spending all the money that the government has. This is just a much better graphic than my trying to draw it with my mouse. So to decrease aggregate demand, and then the multiplier carries it the rest of the way. Five ten is still the full employment level. We want to pull the aggregate demand curve back to that five ten level. So they're going to decrease spending and get the full decrease in aggregate demand that we need. There's some built-in stability to our economy because of our progressive tax system. So let's go down at the bottom and define these terms. A progressive tax system is one that the tax rate goes up the more income that you make. 
So people who make, let's say, $50,000 might pay a tax rate of 18%. People who make $100,000 would not just pay more taxes, but they would pay at a higher rate, let's say uh, 20, 22%. In a proportional, when you read the word proportional, think flat. In a proportional or flat tax system, everybody pays the same percentage. It still means that you would pay more tax as you made more income, but the tax rate would not be going up. So let's say everybody pays a 10% tax. If you make 50,000, you send 5,000 in. If you make 100,000, you send 10,000 in. If you're making more money, you pay more tax, but the tax rate stays the same. And then a regressive tax, no one in the world uses a regressive tax but the idea of a regressive tax would be the more money you make, the less income tax rate would be applicable to your salary. So if you made 100,000, you might pay, um, let's go with 20%, but if you made a million, you might only pay 5%. That's, that's the concept of a regressive tax. The more money you make, the lower your tax rate. No one uses that. We do have some examples of regressive taxes, but not in income taxes. The, when you have a progressive tax system, then it's automatically going to happen that in times of recession, we'll have a budget deficit, and in times of inflation, we'll have a budget surplus. So some built-in stability happens just because of the progressive tax system, but it isn't enough in and of itself to actually correct that aggregate demand curve sufficiently to solve the recessionary or expenditures gap. So here's a graphic that shows that. The red line is government spending. It's the same all the time, regardless of what GDP is. Congress and the president fuss and fight back and forth and they just set the government budget. So that's the same all across levels of GDP, it doesn't change. But the blue line is the taxes that the government receives. So at very low levels of GDP, not so many people are working, and so the government is not collecting taxes from people that are not working or they're underemployed, they're not working as much as they would like. So the taxes would be low. As we move out on the GDP axis, then more people are working, maybe even working more hours, and so the amount of tax revenue that the government receives goes way up. So a balanced budget would be at the intersection of those two, where it says GDP2. That would be government spending and taxes being the same amount. That'd be a balanced budget. To the left of GDP2 is um, reflective of a recession, and you see that Tax revenue falls below government spending, automatic deficit to the right, <coughs> excuse me, be, would be representative of inflation. And taxes are automatically, the tax revenue coming in is automatically above government spending. So we have some built in stability. It's just not enough to correct the economy in and of itself. <coughs> excuse me. So when we think about evaluating fiscal policy, we think about whether the different times we've used it has been enough to actually correct the gap. We can see the cyclically adjusted budget on the next slide, so let's look at that. There's nothing here that's terribly important that you need to know, either for your homework or for the exams, but it's just interesting data. Anywhere you see a negative sign, there's times when we have used, it shows a budget deficit, and so that's time when we have used expansionary policy. So we've had a recession, a recessionary expenditures gap that we were trying to correct. When you see a positive number, those are times when we've tried to use fiscal policy to solve an inflationary expenditures gap. We don't see many of those, do we?
This just gives us an example of times when we've used this uh, fiscal policy in the past. You've heard of the Great Recession, 2007, 8, 9, 18 months is a really long time to be in a recession and GDP decreased more than 4% of the entire economy. So it was a very large, difficult recession. Many people were out of work for quite some time and the government stepped in and tried to stimulate the economy with fiscal policy. In 2008, they did $152 billion worth of stimulus checks but that didn't work. It was still very sluggish and trying. It's not that it didn't work, it's that it didn't work enough. It didn't get the economy moving enough. In 2009, the government came back with $787 billion worth of tax rebates and increase in government spending. And we did see the, rec the recovery. It just takes longer than we hope that it will. We think about the criticisms and the problems with fiscal policy. I want you to hang on to these to compare to those same criticisms and problems with monetary policy. We need to see both sides. So the problems with phys fiscal policy are largely a matter of timing. So the recognition lag means it just takes some time before we realize the economy is in trouble. By definition, it's going to be at least six months of decreasing GDP before we realize the economy might need some intervention. So that's the recognition lag. The administration lag is the time it takes for Congress to enact policies to fix it. Think about being in Congress. There's, what, 535 people in Congress. You have to get, with Congress and the Senate, you have to get all these people, or not all, a majority of these people moving the same direction in their thoughts. You ha they have to decide, well, should we fix this at all? Is it a permanent or a temporary blip? How deep is it going to be? Maybe we should just let the economy recover. Once they've decided that maybe they do need to interfere in the economy and, and do some stimulus of some sort, are we going to do government spending? Are we going to do taxes or some combination? If we're going to do government spending, is it going to be in your district or my district? Because I'm not going to vote for increased government spending that benefits your area of the world if you're not voting for something in my district that benefits my people. So there's a lot of fussing and fighting that goes on in Congress as they decide what policies to enact. That's the administrative lag. I want you to think about how really long that could be because it could be a year for them to decide what they were going to do. And then the operational lag is the time to put the policy into place and let the money move through the economy and let the multiplier have the effect that it needs to have to push that aggregate demand curve the direction we need it to go. There's a lot of political considerations as we do that. There's so much infighting that goes on as they decide how they want to push that. The only other thing on this slide that I really want you to focus on is the crowding out effect. So you know that GDP was C plus IG plus G plus XN, right? Let's write that because I want to make a point here. So we're doing crowding out, crowding out. So C plus IG plus G plus XN. So you know what all these stand for now, household spending, business spending, government spending, and net exports. So if we're going to use, now crowding out only happens in expansionary fiscal policy. So this is an expansionary problem. We're trying to shift that ex, um, aggregate expenditures curve to the right. So if we do that, it's either going to be an increase in government spending or a decrease in tax. Let's say we're increasing government spending. Well, if we increase government spending, that's going to be using borrowed money. So if you can theorize, this is a graph you haven't seen, but if this is the interest rate and this is the quantity, whoops, way down there, let me try this. This is the quantity of money available to be borrowed, so the quantity of loanable funds. There's a demand for borrowed money, right? And there's a supply of it. Well, if the government's going to increase government spending, they're going to want to borrow the money to do that. So here's our original interest rates. When government 
So let's call that I1, I guess. When government decides to spend more money, they're going to have to borrow it. So D1 goes to D2. That increases the demand for borrowed money. Look and see what happens to the interest rate here. Can you see that the interest rate goes up? And so here's I2. Put a dot on that so maybe you think it's an I. Well, when interest rates go up, in order to finance this increase in government spending, what happens to the amount that households and businesses will spend if now at higher interest rates? How about households on houses, cars, refrigerators? They don't spend as much, right? So some consumption goes down. And then what about businesses? Well, they're interest rate sensitive because they can only invest in capital equipment as long as the interest rate is greater than the, that the rate of return is greater than the interest rate. That higher interest rate, fewer projects are going to be profitable. So the crowding out effect says if we have an increase in government spending, the interest rates are going to go up and the, that higher interest rate is going to crowd out some C and IG spending. So we'll get an increase in, in GDP, but it's going to be a smaller increase than it would be if we had a way to do this without increasing the interest rate. So some spending is crowded out. Some C and IG spending is crowded out when we use fiscal policy, expansionary fiscal policy, and increased government spending. Now just moving over, this is a totally different topic. You know, when we increase government spending and the money the government has to borrow it, then we're increasing the public debt. So when we talk about the budget deficit, we'd be talking about the, um, looking at the difference between the amount of government spending and the amount of revenue coming in. If we're spending more than the revenue in that given year, then we have a single budget deficit in that certain year. If you had all the budget deficits and what years that we've had surpluses together, that total debt is the public debt. So you think about how does the government borrow money? Well, they sell securities, U.S. securities, and people all over the world, the United States and all over the world, purchase them in these various forms, T-bills, T-notes, T-bonds, U.S. savings bonds. They're just, those are all government securities. It just depends on the length of time and the size of the investment, whether it's a T-bill or a T-note bond or a savings bond. So then we look to see who owns the public debt. The graphic gives you little pieces of the pie here. So on the right side, the Federal Reserve owns about 11% of all the outstanding U.S. securities, and the US, other U.S. government agency owns about 27%. So that 38% of the debt is just one government agency owing another government agency money. We're not worried about that. That's no problem. Look at the teal colored, where it says U.S. individuals. There are people who purchase savings bonds, particularly. When my kids were born, I was working in an industry that um, people wanted to celebrate my children when they were born, but they really didn't know me. So they sent as gifts a $50 savings bond. A $50 savings bond only costs $25 to buy, and over some number of years, when you present it back for payment, it's worth $50. So. A lot of people do this. My my father would, my goodness, I'm old, so my father was really old, worked for the Wall Street Journal, and every week when he got his paycheck, he would always buy a $100 savings bond, and that would cost him $50, and that's the way he saved all of his life. When he died, we had literally stacks of U.S. Um, savings bonds to be cashed in. So I just want you to get the feeling normal people buy these too, but we, we buy savings bonds, typically Series E. Okay, that we're not worried about that either. That 9% that's held by U.S. individuals, that's scattered over, you know, tons of people, and so that's not a problem. So look at the light blue color, other state and local governments. So that's state and local governments owning a piece of the debt of the United States, and that's okay. That's not bothersome in the red areas, U.S. banks owning some of the government securities, which is going to get to be real important when we look at monetary policy. That's not worrisome either. 
So the part of the public debt that's worrisome is the purple section. The 29% of the U.S. public debt that's held in foreign hands. Theoretically, they could present, like China owns a, a big chunk of the United States public debt. Theoretically, they could present that back all at once for payment, and that would be difficult for the United States to pay up those large sums. But we don't worry too much about it because um, we own Chinese debt and other countries, we by the United States own Chinese debt and other foreign countries' debts. And it would be a real tit for tat thing. You present all our, ours back, we'll present yours back. It's just the problem with the public debt is you do have to pay interest on all of those bonds that are outstanding. And that's a very large chunk of the United States yearly tax revenue. So this list, I tag total debt at 21.5 trillion. I know I've told you that I'm old, <laughs> but I do remember when the public debt was not measured in terms of trillion. It has not been all that many years ago that we crossed over into the trillions. And now we're already at 21 trillion, and this was 2018. So imagine what it is. Well, you really don't have to imagine. In your web browser, type um, in your search bar, US public debt clock, real time. US public debt clock, real time. And look in the top left-hand corner, and it'll just be ticking, 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 going up, 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 up every second. Um, to show you how fast our debt is increasing and what the total amount is. It's bigger than that. So it's just a chart, federal, de federal debt as a percentage of GDP. So I want you to look back in the 1970s. As a percentage of GDP in the 70s, it was less than 30%. So we had GDP represents productive capacity, right? How much we're producing as a nation, monetary value of all the goods, final goods and services produced within the nation in a given year. So less than 30% of our GDP was going to be used up in repaying the public debt. Look where it is now. Just some global information. So 1.8% of all GDP just goes to repay the interest, just the interest charges on the debt. So about 2%. People worry that the nation will go bankrupt. Well, it's not that it couldn't happen. But it's probably a false concern in the United States. I mean, we've seen, I mean, Venezuela is a, is a country that would be worried about this, that their currency system will just completely implode. But at the moment, our currency is still strong and still trades at a strong value. And we have um, a lot of backing in the US dollar worldwide. So it's not that we think we're going to go bankrupt. It's just that more and more of our productive capacity will be shifted towards just repaying the U.S. debt. People worry whether there'll be money in Social Security when it's time for them to retire. So according to this graphic, the funds will be depleted by 2033, and Medicare funds depleted by 2024. Well, that's just right around the corner. I have seen these numbers showing this depletion over all of the years that I've taught, and they just keep pushing it a little further out and a little further out. At some point, we will need to make substantial changes in how the Social Security and the Medicare system works. We just keep increasing the tax rates 
for these two things on the number of people working in order to support the current benefits for those that are retired. That won't work forever. So we, we need to look for some different solutions for funding retirement and Medicare than looking to the government's programs of Social Security and Medicare. These are possible options. We think about these all the time and we've done that. Increasing the retirement age. Uh, 65 was the accepted. Now I think it's up to 67 and a half, maybe 68 for younger people coming in. We could increase the proportion of your earnings subject to the Social Security tax. Right now, after you make so much, and I haven't looked up the maximum amount, of your earnings that are subject to Social Security tax, but once you get that paid off and only higher income earners ever get to there, then the rest of your income is not subject to the Social Security tax. Probably that could change without um, too much pain on most people. Disqualifying wealthy individuals, do you realize that no matter how much you make, no matter how wealthy you are, how many millions you make a year, you still get your Social Security. Is that logical? Maybe we should think about disqualifying the wealthy individuals. We always think about changing uh, how Social Security is held. Right now, the system is, if I were retired, I would get the money that you are paying in right now. Your money is not set in an account waiting for you. Your money is used to fund those that are currently retired, yours and mine, or is used to fund those that are currently retired. There's always thought of saying, well, let's set aside some percentage of that and let you direct that percentage into an actual retirement account for yourself. But to do that, how are we going to fund those people who are currently retired? So it's, it's, a, it's a reoccurring problem that doesn't really have a good solution.